We welcome you in. If you're watching at home with us, we're having a good time with the crew that's here in the Fellowship Hall. and glad that you've joined us tonight. Sorry for the delay. We had some technical difficulties and some conversational difficulties. So anyway, we're glad that you're serving and watching with us tonight as we are here together. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we get started. Lord God, we thank you for today, Father. I thank you for uh, our church family. I thank you for this congregation that's not only sitting in this room right now, but uh, is serving all over our campus, Lord. And, and Father, for the ones that aren't able to be here with us tonight, we thank you that they're either joining online or, Father, that you're working in their heart wherever they may be. Father God, would you help us, Lord, as we pray for one another and for others tonight? Lord God, would you help us to, uh, to seek your will in our own lives and in anybody else's life that you burn in us on our heart to care about? Father God, would you help us to, when you do put people on our hearts, to be responsible and to be excited, to be able to pray for them, to lift them up, to serve them as you give us opportunity. And Lord, to, uh, to, to entrust you with each part of our lives, their lives, and every person's life that you've given life to. Lord God, would you be with us tonight, Father, and encourage us and grow us, Lord, for being here together with one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you see a few updates there on your prayer list. Hopefully you've got a copy of it. And uh, we have uh, there underneath the at-home section. We're glad to have Miss Shirley with us here this evening. Uh, she's had a little procedure to, uh, to check out uh, and to test a spot on her head. Um, and she's doing well. She said the, the shots to, to deaden it before they actually took the, the sample to biopsy or to, or to test um, was no fun, but uh, and hopefully that spared her from what they actually were cutting so, and, and feeling that pain. But, uh, but she'll be getting the results here, you said, a week from Friday. Is that right? So we hope and pray that those will be good, good results, that they'll catch exactly what it is and take care of it. Hopefully it won't even be anything. Uh, but if it is, that they'll be uh, able to take care of it. Uh, continue to pray for Doug Grantham. He, you know, he's been dealing with health issues for a long time, but, uh, but he's having an especially difficult time here these last uh, couple of weeks. So lift Mr. Doug up. Uh, and then also Carolyn Muirhead. Um, any update on Carolyn? Send our text, but I have her back from you. Okay. Pray for Carolyn as she uh, she's been she's been all over the country a little bit doing some traveling. She's been back, but uh, continue to lift her up. So our Sunday school class put her on the prayer list this weekend. Uh, then also continuing to pray for Jason Williams. Of course, that's Jill's nephew, Danny and Jean's son. Um, and uh, Jason's had some some he's health issues. Right now, he's having having a good run. Going to the doctor now and taking his medication. He's coming around pretty good. Good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And, and we uh, he, he went through some tough. Tough days and weeks here ever since in the last several months. So keep praying for Jason, though. Uh, and then, of course, Miss Helen's right here with us. And Miss Helen, tell us about your knees. How are things going? I had an injection in my left knee, and the next Thursday I have will have one in my back. So sure, between the two of us, I said, told her, I said, we may have to have some help next week if we're not able to take each other. I was about to say, if one's not driving the other, you, have, you might have to get a third person involved. If I'm not able to drive her Friday, I said, we'll ask somebody to help us. Well, did the injection give you some relief in your knee? Uh, a little bit. Good. Hey, a little bit's good. A lot be better, but, but a little bit's good. So. Yeah, probably if I sit around and I get doing anything, but, or something out in the yard two hours today, so... That'll, uh, that'll make anybody's knees start to hurt a little bit. I understand. Well, we'll continue to pray for you and uh, that you get relief. And then you said you got the back coming up. Is that next week? Well, and if anybody needs a chauffeur job, um, these ladies love to go, and they get to go quite a bit. But if they're not able to drive one another, they might need you to step in. So uh, uh, it's it's a it's a heavy chaperoning duty, though. So just get ready. Um, but uh, just keeping those two out of trouble. Um, down underneath the cancer patients, there we have uh, Larry Miller. It's been added to our prayer list, and uh, he is dealing with liver cancer. Uh, Miss Agnes uh, told us about that. Any update? It's our daughter. Okay. Oh, okay. Goodness. Well, I'm very sorry to hear that he's dealing with that. We'll pray. For, did they? I don't know how it's going. We'll pray that it's effective and that it takes care of it. Sure. Sure. Well, we'll be praying for him as as they do that treatment. Um, of course, you know many of you saw on Facebook and then talking to him. Wayne Harris had his um, last. Um, as they call it, the bad chemo treatments today. That's how uh, Sue put it on her post there on Facebook. And uh, 
he'll uh, he'll be doing some immunotherapy uh, for weeks to come and in, in other shorter treatments but but they're very pleased with the progress that he's made and the uh, the impact that the chemo that he has been doing now for quite a while has uh, a card. got a card for Wayne going around okay all right what about some other updates and additions Okay, yep, Mr. Wayne Lemon, I was going to mention him in just a minute. Uh, he, Mr. Wayne has been in the hospital since Thursday of last week. Is that, isn't that right, Miss Chris? Was it Thursday of last week that he went in? Yes, I think so. And, uh, and so got, got a chance to, to see Mr. Wayne Monday afternoon, and uh, he was resting. Um, he, he, you know, he wasn't real, uh, I don't know if he knew I was there or not. I think I, I might have woke him up from a nap, which I try not to do when I go into a hospital room. But, uh, uh, but they were you know, taking him to sports medicine, and Ms. Noreen was uh, kind of updating us on. Um, it says, is it, it's a cyst or an abscess on a hip. Right, swing bed unit there. Swing bed. And the MRI mobile unit only comes on Monday, so Monday's a holiday, so we have to wait to get the bill. Mm. And he's not able to walk or anything, but they're doing some therapy, physical therapy. Yeah, he, uh, he, he told me a few jokes and he was laughing, so that was a good thing. He was in good spirits. He told me, he said, Preacher, I got you a present. I said, well, Mr. Wayne, what did you get me? He said, a comb. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, didn't mention, he didn't mention how badly he beat me at checkers the last time I got to visit him at the house, which was bad. So um, he, uh, he, he, took, he took me to the woodshed there. So I uh, was glad to see him and look forward to seeing him get better and, and recover from this. So. All right, other additions or Ms. updates? Elizabeth McCarty died. Did she really? Ray Ainsworth passed away. So. Is he still on there? Yeah. Oh, 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 okay, I got you. I was, was going to say, I thought we moved him. <laughs> well, we're still praying for his family as well as the family of Gloria Brown. There was a, some friends of Jonathan, Gene Grosso. So. Well, I'm sorry to hear about Miss Elizabeth McCarty. Um, just, Jack, I have a special request. Do you remember um, Brother Jack Hester? I remember, yes, ma'am. Over at Howard Grove. We prayed for him for a while there. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, his granddaughter, she's 20, I think she's 20 years old. She had a stroke. Oh. And uh, they did surgery on her yesterday. Mm. And her name is Emily Adams. Emily Adams. And she was going to college up at Delta State. Goodness. Wow. I haven't heard from her today. Yeah, because Brother Jack's right there on our cancer patient. Any update on him? How's he, how's he been doing? Brother Jack, I guess he's doing okay. I Good. Don't, I don't know what he's doing for me. Well, I'm sorry to hear that about his granddaughter. Hopefully they'll be able to yeah. help her recover <laughs> and figure out what caused that. Yeah. I think she was kind of overweight. Really? All right. Any other updates or additions? J.D. Scott. Okay. Uh, be in the youth group with, uh, with him whenever we were younger. Uh, his son told me last Wednesday that he was going to be on a nine-month appointment. I don't know what that entails. I don't know where they're going. But gotcha. Two days after he told me that, his son told me that on Wednesday. Like, on the bus being shipped out somewhere. So. I see. What, what branch of the service is he in? Okay, we'll uh, we'll add him there to that members of the armed forces category and lift him up during that deployment and, and beyond. We're thankful for his his service for sure. And that's J D Scott that we were just talking about. Okay, anybody else? I do know that Holly Lane is not going to start her chemo until eight fourteen. So okay, I don't know if they're doing anything else. You know, it's a couple of different places of cancer, so. The our sister said. Okay. All right. Any others? All right. Well, hey, take just a minute or two if you if if uh, Miss Sandy will spread or pass that card for the 
Wayne and Sue around to you. If you'd like to start another card and pass it around from table to table, write a couple of prayer cards yourself. We can bring you some real quick if you don't already have some. Take just a minute there and as you live, fill out some of those. We'll be sending them out. So raise your hand if you got the one for the Harrises out there. as you wrap up your time of writing cards and you can definitely keep writing them as, as we pray as we study uh, you can write as many as you absolutely like to and that's just fine uh, but as you wrap up that time of writing let's uh, let's uh, enter into a time of prayer uh, and i encourage you if you if you will um, if you want to join hands and pray with the folks around your table that's awesome uh, if you want to pray out loud so the whole room can hear that's great too uh, if you want to pray silently, God answers all of those prayers. Just continue to seek his will. And if you're watching at home with us, we hope you'll join us in prayer wherever you may be. Let's, uh, let's have a time of prayer here in the next few moments. During our, our time that we look over our prayer list, Father, we see loved ones and friends and having all kinds of difficulties, health issues, Father. We, we do pray for Mr. Wayne Lemon as he's in the hospital, Father. <clears throat> we pray for Wayne Harris as he's uh, going through his uh, chemo treatment. And thank you, Lord, that this is his last one. They talked about the, the bad type chemo, Father. Then you pray for him and Miss Sue. Father, there's just uh, so many on our prayer list and so many that's not on the prayer list that we uh, just cannot think of them at this time, Father. We just pray for healing of our, our community and our country, Father, especially the cancer uh, patients, Father. We just pray for peace and comfort for them during that time. In your name we pray.
Lord God, again, we thank you for bringing us here tonight. Lord, we thank you for the great and awesome opportunity we have to pray, Father, for ourselves and for each other, Father, for others in our lives. Lord God, we lift up all those that we've mentioned, many more, Father, that we, that we didn't take time to mention tonight. But Lord, you know them each one by one. You know their hearts better than they know themselves, better than we'll ever know them. Lord God, we pray, Lord, that you would give each person, Father, that is struggling, comfort according to your measure and, Father, according to your will. Lord, for the families that are grieving, Lord, in, in the loss of loved ones, would you give them strength? And, Father, would you heal them as they grieve the loss that they're experiencing? Father God, we pray for our church, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would grow us more and more to be healthier, Father, to be stronger, to be uh, more united, Father, in every way. Lord God, we thank you, Father, for the many ministries that are going on, even as we voice this prayer. And Lord, for the many more ministries you have out ahead of us, Father. Help us to look with eagerness and, Father, with excitement to, uh, to the things that you would have us to do, Father, in, in growing and continuing the ways that we've already ministered, and, Father, the new ways that you'll bring to us as is according to your will. Father, we thank you for your word. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that in, in the offer of salvation, you offer not only that we would be saved from our past lives, but you offer us eternal life, new life that is brand new, and that is something that you will grow in our lives if we'll but participate in it with you. Help us to do that very thing, Lord. Help us to grow, and Father, to be encouraged and challenged by what you teach us tonight from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, as we talk more and more about, and, and uh, we've got one more week on the plan for the Disappearance of Me sermon series as we work through that understanding of looking less and less like us as we grow in our faith and beginning to look more and more like Christ by the grace of God uh, each and every day of our lives. Uh, we know that it's not always a linear journey. In other words, it's not always we start here and over such and such time we go up here and then up here and then up here a lot of times that journey for us and i think every time that journey for us if we're being honest kind of looks about like your retirement portfolio or you know maybe what it used to look like i don't know uh but but you know when it kind of goes up and then it goes down and it goes up and it goes down a little bit and we want that trend to be going upward if that was a graph of our faith our growing faith we want to be able to look more and more like jesus in a trend. That doesn't mean that every day we'll get it perfect, that we'll get it right. But God has grace, he has mercy, and we live in that grace and mercy each and every day that he gives us, that he would be making us to look more and more like Jesus to ourselves, to the people around us, and to him when it comes time for our judgment. Uh, scripture teaches this concept in, in so many different ways, and, and honestly, it's kind of difficult to just narrow down to a, you know, to a handful of messages for this sermon series and then the Wednesday nights that accompany it, um, you know, the, the right passages. But I think in Ephesians chapter 5, we get a, a, really, uh, a really powerful uh, example of what this means. And, and, and as, as, uh, as Paul is writing to the Ephesians, as he writes to them how to live as a Christian, um, my, my copy of the word says instructions for Christian living, and it starts halfway through chapter 4, and we pick up on it in chapter 5, verse 1. Uh, but he's already explained to them a lot about how it is that we should live. And, and that's exactly what becoming and looking more like Christ does for us. As we disappear, he changes our way of life a little bit by a little bit, and sometimes a lot by a lot, to, to live as believers in Christ, to live as followers, as disciples of Jesus. Um, and, and that's what that disappearing of us shows itself as, is that we live in more godly ways. If God expected us or if he commanded us to live perfectly from the moment we were saved from then on, well, that'd be a different story. But that's not what he calls us to do. He gives us the opportunity, but he also gives us that grace to over time, not to put him off, but to follow him and to grow more and more over time. I hope, especially in a room full of people that are the ages we are in the room, that, uh, that, that we can look back and know that we look a lot more like Christ today than we did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago in our faith. And, and for as long as our faith has been present, for as long as we've been saved, I hope that that whole time has been an upward trajectory uh, of looking more and more like Christ every day, messing it up, figuring it out by God's grace and by his leadership, 
and then changing and letting him change us to draw us in. That we wouldn't get caught up, stuck in these things of, well, that's just the way I am. If the way you are, the way I am is sinful, God intends to change it. And in fact, he expects it to be changed. He does not expect, and nor does he brush under the rug, uh, that, that we just kind of hang on to pet sins and do the things we've always done. You know, whatever those pet sins may be. It may be attitudes, maybe actions, maybe words we say or things we hear, I, whatever. Who knows what it is? It's different in everybody's life, even though a lot of us have some things in common. But we don't just say, oh, well, that's just the thing I deal with. No, if that's true, then let's deal with it in the power that God gives us because he calls us to look more and more like Christ, to die to our old self, to not just uh, kind of fall asleep to our old self or put our old self to bed till it wakes back up, but to die to our old self and be made that new creation. In Ephesians chapter 5, in the middle of this instruction on, Christians, on Christian living, uh, Paul writes this to the church at Ephesus. He says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because th these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater. None of those people has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. And for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. In just these first uh, 10 verses or so, Paul gives some pretty strong instruction to us. Um, you've, you know if you've read through Paul's letters, as we've studied through Acts together on Sunday nights for over a year now, you know that Paul is a pretty type A driven person, right? He, he, he sees it very much in black and white, and he tells it the way he sees it. He, he doesn't hold back. He has the love of Christ, but boy, he, he definitely has some hard love that he, uh, that he shares and that he uh, lavishes on other people, uh, especially amongst believers. You say, well, why wouldn't he be easier on the believers than he is on the, on the people who are you know, trying to kill him as we're reading through, studying through Acts? Why, why would he? Because he expects more from those to whom more has been given. Um, if we've been given salvation, if we have escaped the flames of hell, as it's put in Scripture, if we've done that, then he expects, because God expects, that we would grow. And that's where he writes from here in this passage in chapter 5. He said in verse 1, he said, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Have you ever noticed that it doesn't take long for a child to start to walk like somebody they're around, a parent, grandparent? You ever notice that? You ever notice that some families have the same walk? You ever seen that? I mean, like their physical, their gait, their, their, their posture. Like you can look at somebody and go, oh, yep, they're from that family. Oh, yep, they're from the, you know. Like it, it's, it's, it's uncanny sometimes, right? And, and I think that's a very base level example that, uh, that, that children pay attention to the things that are around them. They, they take it all in. You know, when a baby is born, much like as we're celebrating with Steele and Brandy and little Presley, um, you know, inevitably somebody somewhere early in that child's life and throughout the early part of that child's life says, man, I'm just amazed. They're just taking it all in, right? And that's exactly what babies, children do. And so when Paul writes, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, what he's saying is children don't have a lot of other things to, you know, to, to base their following of examples on because they're children, right? And so they get the example that's there most, pre or most prominently in their life and they follow it. They don't have a lot of comparison to make until they get a little bit older. And that's what he's saying. We have a lot of comparative examples in our life, but Paul's saying that we ought to follow 
God's example, follow his plan, follow his will, grow in him without comparing it to all the others because he understands and he again sees it very much black and white to say that nothing else that's an example of, an, you know, of something we will, other than God that we would follow, none of it's better than him. So he says, follow it as if there aren't any other examples, as dear children who are loved. And he says, and in verse two, walk in the way of love in other words, if we grow to look more like Christ, we will grow to be more loving. Now, I'm not talking about the love that, that is super sweet to the people who we are close to and puts up a brick wall between us and anybody else, right? We're not talking about that type of love. Jesus doesn't have that type of love. He didn't show that type of love. He didn't die on the cross just for the people who agreed with him at the time, just for his disciples or for the people who would be good enough to act right or any of that stuff. He died for all. That's the nature. That's the scope of his love. And that's the love that, that Paul tells us in the power of the spirit that we should walk in that way as well. He says, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up, uh, gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, that fragrant offering, when we walk in the love of Christ, when we let the love of Christ grow in us, that other people can, can see. Um, we may be great at a lot of other things, and that's wonderful. And sometimes those other things can be helpful to the kingdom. But like, like Paul will write uh, you know, in another book in, in, Corinth, in 1 Corinthians, if we do all those things but don't have love, it's worthless. It's noise. It's extra. If we, if we, you know, it doesn't matter if we, you know, write a beautiful song about God. If we don't show love, man, that song's not as beautiful as it could be, right? And that song's not as, as much of a fragrant offering to God as living in that love, growing in that love, because that pleases God. That is the ultimate example, uh, the ultimate gauge of how we're measured in looking more like Christ is are we loving Verse 3, he goes on, he says, but, he's, and he's going to tell him some, some things that we need to stay away from. Uh, he says, but among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. And before we get into the rest of the list that starts with sexual immorality, that idea of not even being a hint. Well, is that even possible as we're growing? Well, no, there's going to be a hint or sometimes more of that in our lives. But what he's talking about is to the ends to which God will grow us. He's growing us to where there will be less and less and to the point that there won't be a hint of these things. These are the goals. These are the, these are the, 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 the prizes that we should be chasing after. At no point does he say, like we mentioned as we did the introduction to our lesson tonight, at no point does he say, in the things that you can feel like you can handle or in the sins that, um, you know, that, that, that you know, don't seem like that you can't get over. He says in all this, he says, there must not be a hint of sexual immorality, nor of any kind of impurity or of greed. So those three things, all of those things have to do with knowing God's provision, knowing God's commands and stepping outside of them. Right. So in sexual immorality, God has made sex for, for people to enjoy in the particular confines of a Christian marriage. Um, and, and he's made it to be wonderful and great. Um, but what do people do? We seek it outside of those confines, and it becomes something uh, that, that, that is dealt with in a totally different way. It becomes sinful. The act is the same, but it's the, it's the way that we do such an act uh, that, that makes the difference. It's because where our heart is in that particular act. He says any kind of impurity, so not just sexual immorality, but any type of impurity in our life. He says, look, you know, God tells us, to be pure. He is our pure example. Jesus lived a sinless life that we might could learn about him and start to grow to look more like him. And so he says, look, our goal should be removing all impurity from our life. Not just the impurity that people would be mad at us if they knew about. Not just the impurity that we think in our minds, well, yeah, that hurts others. But this other stuff, it don't hurt nobody else. I can do that. And it's just between me and God. God says he is holy. We should be growing to be holy. And seeing that holiness that he puts in us at salvation grow and permeate out through from our heart all the way through the rest of our lives. And he says of greed, God has given us, he's provided for us what he's provided for us. But greed comes in there and tells us, yeah, that's great. Thanks, God, for all that you've given me but I want more. And in greed, there's never enough, is there? You know, if, if you're greedy for money and you get a million dollars, what do you want? You want the second million. 
right? Uh, or, or you get to half a billion, you want that billion, right? I don't know what that's like. I'm sure that somebody somewhere does. Uh, but the greed never stops. And it's not just greed for money. It's greed for all kinds of things, that desire to want more than God has given, to want more than what God has said is good and right. Those three things in the first part of this, uh, it says, because these are improper for God's holy people, and they are improper for God's holy people because they go, they try to... They, they try to take us beyond what God has said we have and do. Does that make sense? In verse 4, he says, Nor should there be any obscenity, um, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Uh, this, spe- this, this speaks to what we speak, right? This speaks to the taming of our tongue that will be a prevalent teaching throughout Scripture as well. Um, he, he says, no, uh, no obscenity. The things that we say should not be obscene. We should not, uh, not you know, live to tell the next dirty joke or, 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 you know, repeat the next dirtiest line from that movie that we probably shouldn't have spent our time watching to begin with. Um, no foolish talk. Now, foolish talk covers not something necessarily that's obscene, but what's foolish? Foolish is, is something that's not wise. In Scripture, you always see foolishness and wisdom uh, put on opposite sides of the spectrum. And so the things that we say, and we all say some of these things, some of us say more of them than others, that just aren't wise, they're not good, they're not helpful, they're not productive, uh, they don't build up people, they tear people down, so they're foolish. That's foolish talk. He says none of that should be around either. Or coarse joking. Uh, you know, you say, well, wait a minute, does that mean like, you know, j- dirty jokes? Well, no, I think it's more of, you know, even like sarcasm that some of us, you know, deal in pretty well. And I, I, that's something I struggle with all the time. Sarcasm is just, it, they say it's the lowest form of humor, uh, because, but it also, the technical definition of the root words of sarcasm is tearing of the flesh, which is really powerful when you're dealing with trying not to be sarcastic to people, right? Uh, because it does, it, it tears. And that coarse joking is stuff that tears people down all in the name of somebody having fun at somebody else's expense. He says, no coarse joking, because those are all out of place, but instead we should speak thanksgiving. And that fits in with that first list of three to tell us that, hey, God's given us what he calls us to have and what he graces us with. We shouldn't want more or outside or different than that. But yet then we should also spend the, every breath we have that we can speak with should be in thanking God for what he gives us. In verse 5, he says, For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person. And then he reminds us that those types of people are idolaters. That's what Scripture is telling us, not your opinion or my opinion. None of those people, immoral, impure, or greedy, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. What does that mean? Does it mean they can't be saved? No. What it means is when we are saved, we'll look less and less like those descriptions, right? That that we won't remain that way. It's terrible to think, and I think honestly, uh, if, if God were speaking to us, he'd tell us it's impossible to believe that there are Christians who have given their life to Christ fully, who are saved who are growing more in immorality, impurity, and greed than they are in growing like Christ. I think that we have to, and you hear me say it, and you're probably like, man, why does he keep saying that? I think we have to look at our lives. Are our lives growing to look more and more like Christ? And if they are, praise God, let him grow us even faster and even stronger. If they're not, we have to ask the question, what is my salvation? Is it true? Is it real? Is it an act? Is it a custom? Is it a tradition? Is it it anything else other than me giving my life over? Because the way that Scripture defines and describes salvation is that we would come to be saved and that we would grow in salvation to look more and more like Christ. He doesn't give us, God doesn't give us in his word any other categories or any other frameworks to understand salvation. And so we like to say stuff like, oh, well, you know, preacher, I'm trying. Well, are we? Right? I mean, like, sometimes we are. But sometimes we say that, and that's a crutch. Well, I tried, but I didn't get there. But I was trying. Shouldn't I get, a, you know, shouldn't I get an A for effort? That type of thing. Right? Um, that's not how God works. It, it's a matter of, have we given our heart to him? And so if we constantly, over long periods of time, are, are finding ourselves growing in sin, 
it's right for us to question our salvation. Does that mean that, oh, well, you're saying I'm not saved. It doesn't matter what I'm saying. <laughs> it matters what God's saying about your salvation and about how it's lived out in your life and in my life. It's not something that I'm pointing out and saying, y'all should be questioning your salvation. I have to question my salvation. That idea of struggling, of wrestling with it, of, of working it out, our own salvation, as we're told in Scripture, We've got to do that. It doesn't mean that we have to sit back and go, oh, I don't know if I'm saved. He wants us to know, but one of the ways we'll know is by how we're growing. By how we don't just take a moment in time and freeze ourselves at that point and say, well, God saved me back there, and I'm the same person I was back then, so I'm still saved. Well, if you, say, if you got saved and nothing changed, you might have experienced something other than biblical salvation, Right? Um, because that's how the Bible talks about being saved. It is a conscience, a conscious uh, turning, repenting of our sin, and letting God let us die to our old way of life and being raised up as a new creation. And that's why he says these things. Verse 6, he says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. What are some empty words? Empty words would be like, Oh, that's, that's kind of a tough way to talk about it. God, God loves you. He wants, to, he wants you to be happy. Guys, God will make us happy when we're holy. <laughs> and it doesn't, we don't, we don't, why we think we deserve to be happy before we've let him save us is a lie from the devil. It's, it's an absolute deception. And it's what the enemy wants to do because it keeps more and more people from biblically being saved and from living out that salvation and disappearing of their old self and seeing more of Jesus and actually making a a godly difference in the world. He says, let no one deceive you with empty words for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. And this is his warning to us that if we buy into the empty words that say, oh, well, yeah, you hear this and this is what it says, but just like the enemy did back in the garden, did God really say you'd die if you ate from that tree? That same type of deception is used on us now, and it's been used from then to now, and it'll keep getting used until that, that enemy is thrown in the lake of fire forever. That idea of, well, did he really say? That's what leads us down the path that leads to destruction, that leads to having God's wrath. Instead of the gift of Jesus taking God's wrath for us on the cross, we end up having to deal with our own sin by taking the wrath that God has for our unholiness. And those empty words are the ones that tells us, hey, it's okay. Don't get too serious about this whole Christianity thing. Nobody likes to be told they're wrong, so don't tell anybody that what they're doing. Just, I just love them. Just love them. Well, yeah, just love them, but are you, you love your kids and your grandchildren, right? Do you lie to them? Do you let them believe lies for long periods of time and chase after those lies? No, you tell them the truth as lovingly and as, as, as you know, as, firmly as you possibly can. He says, don't let anyone deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, and here's, here's the thing for us as Christians, therefore, do not be partners with them. We all have people around us who are operating in this unholy, deceitful, empty word thing and, and, and falling into these categories that Paul talked about in the first few verses in the passage tonight. Paul says, don't partner with them. Does that mean that you can't have a relationship with them? No. But don't, equal in, or don't enter into and stay in relationship with people who are ungodly, who you're acting as if we're on equal footing. That doesn't mean that we walk around with our nose in the, you know, in the air or even our nose stuck in the Bible uh, and act holier than other people. But our conduct is going to be decided by who's around us. If you don't believe that, just sit there and you know, watch people. Watch people when they're around this group and then watch when they're around that group. And then when you hear that they're around another group, they say and do different things. Depending, we say and do different things depending on who's around. That's just part of who we are as people. That's part of sinful nature. We don't, you know, the people who are the same person everywhere they go, that's called integrity. It's something we have to grow in, right? What he's saying is don't partner with them because good, or excuse me, bad company corrupts good character. You've heard that from Scripture before. And it's not just a, oh, well, hey, be careful. It could if you're not strong enough. No, it does. And it will. And it is. We have to make sure we're careful of our partnerships. <clears throat> And then the last three verses uh, that we looked at tonight, he says, for you were once darkness. That's the old life. There was no light in you, just like in God, there is no darkness. 
we're the, as, as unholy sinners, we're the opposite of God. So in us, there was no light. Well, they were a good person and then they got saved and got even better. No, they were a sinner destined for eternal punishment and separation from God. And then they got saved and now they're different. That's how that works. That's how scripture teaches that. He says, once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Are we light because we got better, because we planned new ways, and because we you know, started better habits? No, we're light because the light came into us. Jesus made us the light of the world, took us from being children of darkness to children of light, took us from being dead in our sins to alive in him. He says, live as children of light. And then verse 9 is a parenthetical description here. He says, for the fruit of light of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. You can tie this to the fruit of the Spirit from another one of the epistles and, and understanding what that looks like. But he just gives us a shorter list here saying, look, if you're living in the light, if you're living as the light that God makes you when you're saved and grows you in in your salvation, then you'll grow in goodness, righteousness, and truth. And to grow in goodness means to be gooder and gooder, right? Uh, to grow in righteousness means to look at everything in our lives and want to take away the things that are unrighteous and grow in the righteousness that he gives us. And then in truth that we wouldn't listen to any lies, much less participate in them. And then in verse 10, he comes out of that parenthetical description and he says, following off of living as children of light, he says, and find out what pleases the Lord. Tonight, whether you're 45, 95, 155, doesn't matter your age, for the ones that are down the gym, if they're 15, for the ones that are nursery, they're not even five yet. Age doesn't matter at all. What pleases the Lord is a changed life. And that changed life is not brought about by what we do. It's brought about by what he offers us and what we submit to him in, and that is salvation. Folks, we can try to complicate it all we want, and people have for a long time, but that's the bare bones of the gospel, is that apart from God, we are sinful. There's nothing good in us, but God sent his son Jesus, who was in no way evil, in no way sinful, not even a hint of sin in him. He was holy, he sent him to die for us, that we might be able to be reconciled, redeemed, and made right with God. This evening, I hope and pray that for us as Harrisville Baptist Church, as those who attend here, those who are members here, those who participate in the ministries here, I hope that we're growing and looking less and less like us and more and more like Jesus as we've learned about a little bit tonight as we'll continue to learn about the more we read Scripture. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, help us to do what you've taught us tonight. And Father, what you've been teaching us for as long as we've been aware of Scripture, to put our faith fully in Jesus and to learn to look more and more like him in every way. Father, help us to, to the, let that be true of us. We can't do it on our own. We can desire it, but even our desire will be limited until we fully sell out in faith to you. And Lord, then you'll change our desires. You'll change our minds. You'll change our hearts. You'll change our will by making us a new creation. Help us to decrease as you increase in us. And Lord God, let what will, Lord willing, uh, speak about Sunday morning. Let uh, our lives no longer be about us, but the life that we live now, let it be all Christ. So take us now and send us wherever you'll send us, Lord, and let us do those things according to your will and all for your glory. We thank you for your love and your grace made known to us through Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen.